And there should be a number of people who are not on my list. I know I had at least one talk to me. So uh, Reagan obviously is here because this is, is a birthday today. It is today. Uh, awesome. Lindsay, Helena, who's new? Diksha, Zach, I've talked to him. Cassie Melheisen. Yep, you Kayla, Jerry. Is Jerry here? Okay. All I see is Michael's pinnacle tat. <laughs> um, and then Ryan, Michael, Chad, Sally, Jaren, Toussaint, Tori. That's everybody that I have on my list. Now, who else is here? There's Bridget. And there is Austin. Anyone else? All right, I think that covers it. Okay, good. I was feeling bad. I thought, wow, numbers dropped more than I anticipated. Um, <laughs> Carrie Wolf and I were going over results of the class, and she thought that it's important for me to point out to students that everyone who had attendance you know high enough to get a zero on their attendance score got a b plus or better i think well no i think there was a c plus but you know the, the average grades were really high because she said like halfway through students came to her and said i'm failing and it's impossible to raise the grade yeah, like one of those students got an a minus <laughs> so she thought it's important that people recognize that you know grades are not so so dire that yeah. I hope that my grades are realistic to learning, but they are definitely on the higher side of average. All right, new semester, basically the same policies. Um, Helena, I will, everyone but you knows all the policies, so I'll spend some time with you separate to make sure that you're up to date on what we're doing. But here are some changes. Change number one. For lab, there will be a group project. And that group project is going to replace <clears throat> three. Three lab periods, two for work, and one for the presentation. Now you can see I've had these posters up in the class from last year. I have some posters out on bulletin boards on either side of the door you come in from last year. Those are from the group projects. The group project is something that is supposed to enable students to use teamwork and to do something that they're interested in. Now, the parameters of that group project are you need four people for your group. You need to, by next lab period, not tomorrow, but the week after, we won't be having a lab activity the week after tomorrow. It will be making sure that you have formed up a group and have a topic that I've approved for your project. Now, the topics need to be topics that are things that we're covering this semester. So you can't, for instance, do, well, I'm going to do a time of flight dropping a ball, you know. That, that's first semester. It needs to be something we're covering second semester. So that means it can be from the realm of electricity, magnetism, optics, um, nuclear physics, atomic physics. Uh, I don't think I put in particle physics in our schedule. But it's not like you would have a particle physics experiment in it. The project needs to be something that is not too simple. You know, I, I once let a group do the same project that my son in sixth grade was doing, that is using a orange for a battery. And he did a better job than they did. It was very embarrassing. Because that's a really, really simple project. Well, they, they kind of lied. They, they said that they ran a little Game Boy with their battery. Any simple calculation tells you you can't. You can produce enough voltage, but not enough current. Anyway, the, um, the only limitation I am putting is that you can't do one of the projects that was done last year. So you, you can see the projects that were done last year. You got three in here and two on the bulletin boards outside. And so those ones, you can't redo them just because, well, you probably 
find it too tempting to just go and say, hey, what did you guys do? Okay, we're doing exactly the same thing. And I want it to be a little more of your own. You can, you know, buy little kits if necessary. Um, you always need to be able to explain how they work. So the problem with buying kits is usually their complexity is higher, and that makes it harder for the explanation part. So that's why I allow the, the trade-off. And like I said, they have to be approved by me. And finally, you have a group expense account of $50 that includes the printing fee, which is around $15. You have to make a, a poster like that, and so you have another like $35 for other things in each group. You got a question, Kessie? Yeah, uh, is it just an invention, or do we have to build it and it works? Um, yeah, it, it needs to be something where you build the project, and on the final demonstration, you're supposed to demonstrate it working. Now, sometimes you have to demonstrate with video because you can't do it. Um, although, I, mean, I had students that made a little electric levitator, which was really dangerous because you're using like 110,000 volts. Um, but you know, they sat out in the lab room and they levitated it for everyone to see, which is really cool. And, and arcs everywhere, of course. Okay. okay, so we'll talk about that more in lab, but that is a big difference. So we'll have a lot less lab activities. Um, the reason that it was four, this is from last year when I had four instead of three lab periods, is because of the additional tests the students wanted taking away a lab period already. That's why that is. And the reason you have the lab periods free is so you have time to work on your projects. You don't have to work your projects during lab time, but you have release time, if you will, so you can work on it. Okay, another change. We have a required field trip. On April 22, we're going to go five miles down the road to Nebraska Western University, where the Nebraska Academy of Sciences has their conference. You will be required to fill out a little worksheet. It's very simple. And you could probably do it in an hour. It depends on which things you do. We will provide transportation if you need it. Um, generally, I plan on taking the morning for doing that. Many of your other science classes will also be going and doing some kind of activity. And I certainly allow students to use the same report materials from one class and my class. Because it's not like we want you to do extra work. We just want to make sure that you paid attention to a few things and learned something. <coughs> um, this is not a change. Homework's still on expert TA. But the one below, instead of reading quizzes, our textbook now has a new facility that's called Concept Coach which is essentially the same idea as reading quizzes, except for it is done with a, well, it's a stronger methodology. It's probably not better in terms of making sure students are honest, because every student gets the same questions every time. But they're essentially reading quiz type questions. And I recommend, OK, back up. I have decided to make these so they are just like reading quizzes due by five minutes before class time. So what you have to do is answer these questions from the textbook on the website for the textbook. One thing that's important is you have to actually use a different link to go to the textbook or you won't have this available. So in the um, syllabus, I wrote down what the link is to go to the textbook that makes these available. And you'll have to go in and register. It's a free account. And yeah, we have some silly passphrase that we have to put in to get into this class. Endless tissue. Yeah, there's our there's our passphrase um, to get into this class. And then you need to do the sections that we'll be lecturing on each day before coming to class. Now, of course, nobody did that before today, and today was in theory chapter eight, one through three. So for Wednesday, you'll need to do 8, 1 through 3, and the, was it 4 through 7, whatever it is for the next day. So that is in place of the reading quizzes. And I strongly recommend that you go ahead and have one browser page with the actual textbook and one browser page with the quiz questions, because I want you to be able to figure out the answers and get the right answers. Um, the way it works, the pedagogy is, that it asks you a question, and you have to type in an answer. 
The truth is that answer is never considered. But that answer is for you to try to put your thoughts down and organize your thoughts. When you submit, then it's going to bring up a multiple choice, and then it's going to grade you on which multiple choice option you select. But the first one there is to, to help you in analyzing your thought. And you have to put something in. Yes, you could put Z, Z, Z. But hopefully you'll use it for the learning process that educational research indicates is the best way of helping you learn when you read the textbook. So that is a big change. Instead of reading quizzes, you have that. I anticipate it should take about the same amount of time. That's why I just replaced it. Right? At first I thought about adding it as a second thing. I'm like, well, no, because time. All right. And no flip Fridays. I was going to ask questions, but I didn't want to ask questions in a way where students would feel like I would know what their personal opinion is and might take offense at that. But I am going to wait and see what the um, course evaluation said about the Flip Fridays to reevaluate for next year. Um, my own thinking was that they were taking a lot of time and slowing down the process of the class. And so I'm hoping students have helpful suggestions that would help me modify and remedy that so that they can be smoother and more effective if I choose to employ them in the future. But no flip fries this year. <coughs> and by the way, if you didn't get a syllabus, of course they're on Moodle, and I have some up here as well for all of the college physics ones are gone, but they're still general physics ones. All right, we're gonna talk about electricity. So now we're shifting into no more what's changed, but what are we doing? Electricity as early as 600 years before Christ. Everybody should be aware BC means before Christ, very literally. There are some people who don't like to reference Christ, and so instead of saying BC, they say BCE, and make it before common era. And then instead of saying AD for Anno Domini, they say uh, BC before current, uh, common era. And CE for common era. But um, as much as 600 years before Christ, it was known that there was something you could do by rubbing amber and charge. And, and, well, getting something. And I want to talk a little bit about the idea of charge. Because the more and more I teach, the more and more I see connections that I didn't see when I was a college student your age. So when we talked about the force of gravity, what did the force of gravity depend on? Distance and, and mass. And then there was a constant proportionality. We can think of that mass as a charge, a charge being something that affects a force. And so the mass, I could have called a mass charge. But we generally just call it mass. When we talk about electric force, we're going to talk about another kind of charge. This charge is an electric charge. But it works exactly the same as the mass charge did. In fact, it was discovered by Coulomb that the force relationship between two charged particles, two particles with electric charge, and two, char or two particles with mass charge is exactly the same. They both have the same equation for the force it's going to come up, but I'm just going to mention it now. The force for gravitational charge, we all know, is capital G, mass 1, mass 2 over R squared. For electric charge, the only difference is a different constant, a different symbol for the electric charges. That's it. Those are exactly the same because the electric force and the gravitational force are essentially the same equation. There are a lot of people, a lot of very wise physicists, who spent a lot of time trying to find ways to combine these forces because looking at those equations, it looks like they should be the same thing. And so there are a lot of people that spend time looking for what we call grand unifying theories, guts that will combine the four known forces. Those four known forces, we had at the very beginning of the first semester. Who remembers the four forces? Strong nuclear, large nuclear, 
it's actually strong and weak. Strong, strong nuclear and weak nuclear, and then the two we just talked about, the electromag or, yeah, electromagnetic and the gravitational. People have been able to combine the theories for the electromagnetic force and the weak nuclear force. So you might hear people talk about the electroweak force. That is a combination of those two. And if you count it that way, then there's only three fundamental. Yeah? Is that Q1 or 2 for that second? Um, oh, that's a 2. Oh. You, you can't read my 2 that's just a vertical line? That's crazy. <laughs> All right, thank you. So there is a difference between these two forces. The difference between the two forces is the force of gravity is always attractive. You might remember I said so, you know, I think it was Chad and, and Austin, but I could be wrong, are attracted to each other. In fact, we're all attracted to each other due to the gravitational force. It's just always attractive. So gravitational force, the, you go in the universe and you have things like stars and galaxies and whatnot. The more mass you have, the stronger that force always is. Now with the electrostatic force, that's not the same. So with the electrostatic force, let's get out some of the toys. And look at experiments done by such notable physicists as Benjamin Franklin. So here is a little pith ball. Speaking of which, you see that Michael Tyson is now a judge on a show about incredible minds. Who? Mike Tyson. Mike Tyson, yeah. Whose mind is indeed incredible, <laughs> but not the way we tend to think. Um, okay. And he has a lisp. That's what made me think about that. All right, so instead of amber, I have here just a rubber rod. The rubber and the amber work the same. <laughs> here I have what used to be some rabbit fur or sheep fur or something. It's a handful of fur. So if I take this and put it on here, you see nothing happens at all. This is metals. Metals conduct electricity. By conducting electricity, we mean that electrons are pretty free to move. This here is an insulator. The rubber is an insulator. Electrons can't move freely on this rubber. They're pretty much stuck. You have electrons. You take them off or add them, but they can't move. So if I rub this amber with the fur, hopefully amber and fur is what I'm supposed to be using. I never pay attention to the materials. And I bring this up here. Ah, now it did something. That's the kind of experiments that people were doing, saying there's something funky going on here. And people learned that I did this. If I bring this up close, you can see it's moving out a little bit more. Bring it back, it falls back a little bit. And then if I take something like glass, and my silk is gone, so we'll try polyester. <laughs> yeah, go, go, whatever this shirt is my wife bought's made out of. <laughs> if I rub this up, hopefully it'll work. So bring this up and it collapsed down instead of moving out. Did the opposite thing. Now I'm gonna to touch this with my finger. What happens here is charge just goes into my body, leaves that. Now I bring it here, and now it pushes out when I get close. And I'll touch it. And... So there's two different types of charge. With mass, there's only one kind of mass, right? Mass, the end. We didn't say there's attractive mass, and repulsive mass, or anything like that. But there are two different kinds of charge. So Ben Franklin, <coughs> he said, yeah, I think this is a fluid. That might sound familiar. Remember when we talked about heat? The initial theories were that heat is a fluid. It's something that flows. They called it the caloric, hence we have the calories. So Ben Franklin said, I think this is some kind of fluid. And whatever kind of fluid we get on our amber rod when I rub it with the fur, I'm going to call that negative. That's what Ben said. And so he said, we have two different types. Just going to call one negative and one positive. And we should have charge. You know, if it's a fluid, 
You take some away from here, you're left with the opposite. Interesting rules. Now, <clears throat> it is important that I once again reify, reify, that is not a word, reiterate or clarify. I'm just going to make up words. Reiterify, it's clarify and reiterate, put together. That we have insulators and conductors. Fundamentally different behaving materials because insulators don't allow electrons to move. You can add them and take them away, but they don't move around. Conductors, the electrons can move. So in a conductor, such as a piece of metal, if I put an electron here, it can move anywhere on there. Now, further research was done into electricity and magnetism, and I'm going to go through a few more things and then end the class free with a lot of playing games because, well, that's what we're going to do in lab tomorrow as well is just play with electricity. The, the difference in the conductors and insulators is important because of safety things. I have up here in front some wooden shelves. The reason I have those shelves is because wood is a good insulator. And so I'm going to stand on those when I get that thing up and running so that my body is insulated. I don't have charge leaving my body. We've all been shocked, right? Shocking is occurred when charge rapidly exits or leaves your body. When you're charged up, you don't notice it, except for maybe your hair stands on end. My hair being of a certain length probably won't do much. A rule about charge, coming from Ben Franklin's initial ideas, is that charge is conserved. What does conservation mean? Doesn't change. So charge, Net charge can't change. So if you start with this amount of charge, you're going to end with that amount of charge. You can't create charge, you can't destroy charge. Now, you can create charges, you just can't create charge. An experiment we'll learn about later in the school year called pair production, where I have a particle of light a photon that interacts with... Um, a, nu a nucleus, and it suddenly produces out of nothing an electron and a particle that's exactly like an electron but has a positive charge, which we call a positron. For any other material, we would have called it an anti-electron. And so you can create electrons, and you can create anti-electrons, but they're always created together, so the total charge is zero. So you can't change the charge, but you can actually create charges. So that's a fundamental rule. Charges can serve, can't create or destroy it. Leads to some other interesting observations. Um, everything on this slide I've already talked about. How big is electric charge? The charge of an electron is very well measured to be 1.602, that's as far as I have to memorize, times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. C is our symbol for charge, it stands for Coulomb, named after Charles Coulomb. Docker there. That's extra funny, thank you. <laughs> okay, so the Coulomb, if you look at that number, 10 to the minus 19, a Coulomb is really big compared to the charge of an electron. Most charges we deal with are in the microcoulomb range. We're not dealing with Coulombs all that often. But the Coulomb is a big charge. It was Charles Coulomb who did the experiments to determine that equation for force between electric charges, which I hope is, nope, not on this slide. Well, I already wrote it once. Here's fundamental charges as far as you're concerned. Now I say as far as you're concerned. When you're reading through the textbook and answering those concept coach questions, you're going to learn that these are not all of the charges. A proton has a charge that is positive, 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. An electron has a charge that's negative, 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. Those two charges are exactly the same magnitude, but opposite in sign. One's positive, one's negative. So we use the symbol E to represent 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. And so an electron has a charge of minus E because it's negative. A proton has a charge of plus E because it's positive. 
And a neutron is named a neutron because it's neutral. It has a charge of zero. Now, when you do those concept coach questions, you're going to find things like quarks. Quarks. We have the first family of quarks are up and down. And an up quark has a charge of plus 2 thirds E. And a down quark has a charge of minus 1 thirds E. And to make a proton, you put two ups and a down. So I'll actually write this down here so we can see it. So we always say that the electron is the fundamental unit of charge. But here we see charges that are one-third and two-thirds that. And so to make a proton, we put in three quarks. Protons, neutrons, have three quarks. Um, our baryons have three quarks, and protons and neutrons are baryons. And so how am I going to make the charge of a proton, which is plus E, from ups and downs. Okay, if I do up, up, down, then that's going to be 2 thirds E plus 2 thirds E minus 1 third E, and that's equal to E. And so that's how the charge works out for a proton. I'm not going to do the neutron for the very simple reason because that's what you're asked to do in your concept coach question. <clears throat> All right. Now I think I'm going to have my picture and then play. It's time to play. Um, oh. <laughs> the, yeah. Just skipping by this. This is talking about the size of charges, and one nanocoulomb is a typical size of charge. There's finally the Coulomb's Law equation I was looking for. I forgot. I got started on the direction, and then I got to the two types of charge. I've got to come back to direction. Good thing I have this to close up this part of the lecture. When we have the force of gravity, it was always attractive. But with charge, we saw from my demonstration here that we had two different types of behavior. We have some that's attractive and some that's repulsive. And so... The equation here for force, notice it's a vector equation, and we have the r with a hat over it. That means in the direction of the radius. It's a unit vector, has a magnitude of 1 in the direction of the radius, pointing from 1 to 2. So the force between 1 and 2 is going to be k charge 1, q now stands for charge, q2 divided by r12 squared. The r is the separation between the centers of the two charges. And then it has that direction. If Q1 and Q2 are both positive, then that's going to be because of the negative in my parentheses in the negative R12 direction. If they're opposite signs, then Q1 times Q2 will be a negative value, and it will be in the plus R12 direction. So we have attractive or repulsive. And we have a very simple rule that we can use here. We have opposites attract, that's a T, and likes repel. And of course, it's always just a little useful to make sure I define what this phrase means and not leave it as an assumption that you know. Opposites means charges with opposite signs. So a positive charge and a negative charge are opposites. And so a positive charge is attracted to a negative charge. Likes repel. Likes mean they both have the same sign. So a negative charge and a negative charge are like charges. And they'll repel. They'll push away. A positive charge and a positive charge is that likes are opposites. They're likes. So a positive and a positive will also repel. Okay. It's time to start playing. And first thing I have to do, this thing here is somewhat finicky. I think it's just because the belt in it is old. 
but it seems to have to warm up for a while before it works effectively. This is what we call a Van de Graaff generator. Don't know why that did that. Because I didn't get it. Okay, now I have to talk about the Van de Graaff generator is a conveyor belt for charge. In lab tomorrow, we'll have people who explain it more carefully. But at its basis, you have a roller at the bottom and a roller at the top, and you have a rubber belt that rolls over them. As the rubber belt rolls on the roller, it's like I have my rod that I rub with the hook. And so it rubs off one type of charge. It depends on what the two materials are. So at the bottom, the roller at the bottom is a different kind of material than the roller at the top. <coughs> the result is charge is being deposited on the rod at the bottom, goes up the belt like the conveyor belt, and then is taken off the conveyor belt at the top. So what this is doing is charging up, yeah, not very much yet, it's charging up that globe on the top that couldn't charge on it. Just like you have a conveyor belt and you put your silage on the conveyor belt and you start to fill up that feed wagon. So you might have to do a lot of it. So we're filling this up with charge so that we're going to eventually, eventually have a lot of charge there. And when it has a lot of charge on, then we do all kinds of fun things, like shock our friends. But that's, well, that's pretty fun.
demonstrate cool effects.
show.